Now, many people who are sort of outside the YouTube sphere have no idea who Mr. Beast is, but Mr. Beast is the single most popular YouTuber on YouTube, meaning he has tens of millions of followers. A huge number of people follow his videos. Even if you're not sort of a routine YouTuber, you've probably seen some of his videos. He very famously, a couple of years ago, for example, did a remake of Squid Game in which he actually hired a bunch of people or offered a bunch of people to take part in Squid Game. They're then shot with paintball guns. His videos are incredibly well done. They've been viewed hundreds of millions of times each. We're talking about billions and billions of views for Mr. Beast. He's a very young guy. He's like 24, 25 years old. His actual name is Jimmy Donaldson. And the entire sort of drive of his show is that he does these incredibly creative videos, very clickable videos. And, and very often he does things for charity in his videos as well. We've talked about him on the show before, helping to, to donate money so that people who are going blind can actually have surgery or making sure that people in Africa have shoes. There's some really cool stuff on his YouTube channel. The entire sort of vibe of his show is that he and some of his friends, sort of the bros, they're constantly going and they are doing things together. It's him and his team of friends. Well, now Mr. Beast has a problem. Mr. Beast's problem is that one of his co-stars, his longtime friend Chris Tyson, has decided that he is now a woman. Now, normally, this isn't really a problem, right? You got a friend, your friend decides that they're a woman. Eh, that's, a, that's a you issue, right? I mean, that's, that's just a question for you and your life. How are you going to handle that? But the problem is, for Mr. Beast, that Chris Tyson is actually a member of the cast. Chris Tyson is a person who was part of sort of the bro crew, and now he is saying that he is gender transitioning into becoming a woman. And for people who are fans of Mr. Beast, this sort of changes the dynamic a little bit sort of changes the dynamic. Right? If, if, you are, if you are somebody who watches Mr. Beast regularly and suddenly a bunch of bros are interrupted by one guy who is pretending to be or believes that he is a woman, it changes the dynamic in rather stark ways, especially given the fact that Chris Tyson has in the past made sort of transgender jokes, jokes about transgenderism. Well, a little while ago, a few months ago, he decided that he was going to begin hormone replacement therapy and he started looking significantly less masculine on camera and significantly more feminine on camera. Now, listen, if you were running a TV show, which is essentially what Mr. Beast is doing, if you're running a piece of entertainment, then typically what you do is you cast for roles, right? And now on, on YouTube, because it's all about authenticity, very often they're just sort of your friends. But the reality is the dynamic created is a dynamic that is for the cameras. And so typically speaking, let's say that you were running a show, you know, other than the Umbrella Academy, and one of your stars decided they were a member of the opposite sex. What would you do? Well, you'd probably just say, well, you don't get to be in the show anymore because the dynamic of the show has changed. And that has nothing to do with bigotry. That has to do with the dynamic and success of the show. Not only that, if you were actually friends with somebody, if one of my close friends were on camera with me and they decided to make a radical life shift, they wouldn't expect me to continue to put the success of my career on hold or at risk because they were making a personal life decision. In other words, it's not my job to make room for you on this particular show because you've decided to make a life decision that now cuts directly against the entire dynamic of the show. Now, I mentioned the Umbrella Academy a moment ago on Netflix. They've run into serious trouble because the Umbrella Academy started off with Ellen Page, a woman, playing a girl on the show, like a straight woman on the show. And then Ellen Page decided that she was a lesbian. And so they actually added a lesbian storyline in the middle of Umbrella Academy. And then Ellen Page decided that she was Elliot Page, a man. And so then they turned the entire character into a male. And that just doesn't work. I mean, it's ridiculous and it's silly. But that's exactly what is sort of now expected in the entertainment world is that everyone who casts these shows, they have to treat people who completely change their entire identity as completely unfireable, like absolutely unfireable. So all this began again when Chris Tyson started to change his appearance on the show to appear more feminine and then started tweeting out publicly about the benefits and wonders of gender-affirming healthcare. So Chris Tyson tweeted out, and again, he's changed his entire Twitter profile. So now he has sort of an, a, an illustration of himself looking like a woman, although he doesn't look anything like that in real life. He looks like a dude who's wearing some makeup and has some long hair. He says, informed consent, HRT, that'd be hormone replacement therapy, saved me and many others' lives. The hurdles GNC people, gender non-conforming people, have to jump through to get life-saving gender-affirming healthcare in a first world country is wild to me. Just let people make informed decisions about their own bodies. And people started pointing out, well, Chris, you know, when you make life decisions, it actually has impact on other people. See, this is, this is the magnificent narcissism of modern society is that we decide that the personal life decisions that make us feel better in the cockles of our heart, these are the things that really matter in life, not our relationships with other people, not in Chris Tyson's case, the relationship that he has with his wife and his kid. He has a wife and he has a kid. Let me just express something to you right now. If you decide that your feelings of comfort and gender identity are more important than your relationship with your wife and your child, you are being selfish. This is true for everyone. If you're a man, 
and you decide that you're going to cheat on your wife because, listen, it makes you feel better about yourself. You're hitting your 40s, and now it's time for that midlife crisis, and you decide to go get a younger model and then take that for a ride. Well, that is you being a bad person. That is you being a narcissist. That is you ignoring the actual priorities in your own life. Life is about what are you going to sacrifice on behalf of the people who mean the most to you. It is not about you feeling the best you can feel on the interior of you, especially because that's a really subjective feeling and it turns out it's incredibly transitory. Not only is it transitory, when you're telling lies to yourself, it's incredibly damaging. When you're telling yourself a lie that you're a member of the opposite sex and meanwhile, completely destroying presumably your relationship with your wife and also completely confusing your own child, that actually is a bad thing to do. This should not be a controversial statement because again, this is true for everyone. Gay, straight, gender nonconform, whatever you are, your top priority is providing for your child a level of stability and understandability to the world. And to your spouse, your highest commitment is to being the best husband or the best wife to your spouse that you can be. This does not involve you seeking yourself. You seeking yourself is a 1960s, 1970s garbage construct in which your own personal priorities take priority. Hey, in any case, some people pointed out that, you know, this changes the dynamic of Mr. Beast's show. That this actually is a problem for Mr. Beast's show. So Mr. Beast was now caught between a rock and a hard place. Because what our woke society has now created is a rock and a hard place, not for Chris Tyson, whose choice this was in the first place. You know, whatever he chooses to do with his own family, he is free to do, although I am also free to morally criticize that thing. Because again, anybody who places their own priorities above those of their family is doing the wrong thing. But Mr. Beast was then caught between a rock and a hard place that our, that our, our insanely left-wing society has created for him. We'll get to that momentarily first. As you may have noticed, the economy is getting worse by the day. It's time to change your spending habits. Well, if you haven't changed the way you buy meat yet, you really, really should. I'm going to give you three reasons to subscribe to Good Ranchers. First, Good Ranchers is giving you free bacon for a year. That is a pound and a half of bacon in every single box. That is a $240 value. Second, Good Ranchers offers a price lock guarantee, meaning when you subscribe, your price doesn't change for the length of your subscription. When the price of meat is expected to increase by another 4.5% in the coming year, this could be a massive savings for you and your family. And third, Good Ranchers meat is unlike any other meat. They're all natural burgers, USDA prime steaks, better than organic chicken will change your standard for great meat. They actually went way out of their way. They somehow obtained for me a kosher steak and then they prepared it the way they would a non-kosher steak. Let me tell you, it was an amazing, amazing steak. So I'm, I'm just telling you, their quality of meat is fantastic. Head on over to goodranchers.com. Use my code Ben for 20 bucks off your order. You'll get free bacon, great meat, a secure price, 20 bucks off your very first order. Use promo code Ben at goodranchers.com. That's goodranchers.com. American meat delivered. Again, check them out right now. Good Ranchers. Dot com. Use promo code Ben and you'll get 20 bucks off your very first order. Okay, so now Mr. Beast is caught between a rock and a hard place because his friend, a person he has cast on the show and who is now making presumably millions of dollars because he is friends with Mr. Beast and was a cast member of the show, has decided to completely change his character. Now he's no longer just a dude bro who's with him on the show. Now he is a man who pretends that he's a woman. By the way, this actually has real ramifications for the way that the show feels, the way the show looks. And they, they, there's a recent video from Mr. Beast in which this dude, Chris Tyson, who believes that he is a woman, they're interacting and making ex all the all the interactions that used to be kind of normal are now extremely, extremely awkward. OK, but Mr. Beast is stuck between a rock and a hard place because if he says to Chris, listen, Chris, you're screwing up that dynamic of the show. Right? We didn't bargain for this. You want to make your personal life decisions. You want to take some time. You want you want to figure out what you're all about. That, that's fine. But you don't get to enact your personal dramas on the set of my billion dollar show. You don't really get to do that. And if you do that, I got to say that that is not kind to me as a friend. He, he's not allowed to do that. Our society says that he must actually sacrifice his business for the sake of his supposed friend who's willing to put him in this position in the first place. Because if he doesn't put this guy on the air and destroy the dynamic of a show or at least harm the dynamic of a show, then that means that he's a transphobe. But if he leaves the guy on the air, it completely messes up the dynamic of the show and fewer people are going to watch it. And you can see that in the number of dislikes that have been racking up on Mr. Beast's YouTube page. So Mr. Beast, had to make the choice. And so the choice that he chose is, of course, the wokest choice. He tweeted out, yeah, this is getting absurd. Chris isn't my nightmare. He's my bleeping friend and things are fine. All this transphobia is starting to piss me off. OK, that's that's Mr. Beast's choice. But you also have a choice, which is whether you actually wish to watch Mr. Beast's videos right? or whether you want your kids to watch it. Mr. Beast stuff is very safe for kids, typically speaking. It's kind of silly stuff like what is the difference between a a $1 flight versus a $100 flight versus a $10,000 flight, right? It's that, it's that kind of stuff. Well, I, I do not feel as though my kids should be exposed to a man who believes that he is a woman on the YouTubes until they're of age to understand exactly what is going on. A lot of other parents are going to have that same exact question. And that's not the fault of Mr. Beast. That's the fault of Chris Tyson. And him putting his friend in that position 
is on a personal level somewhat inexcusable. But again, this is all about our society basically deciding that personal authenticity comes at the cost of everyone else around you. Everyone else around you must be made to mirror your priorities. It's the only thing that matters. What makes Chris Tyson feel good is the only thing that matters in all of this, which is why presumably Chris Tyson tweeted about his own kid. He tweeted, quote, I won't let people talk about how I, quote, abandon my child. He's the only priority in my life. I have his love and support, and that is all that I need. I'm doing this for him. If that confuses you, educate yourself. If, if that makes you mad, leave. Simple. Um, you're not doing this for him. You're not. That's a lie. This is like the parents who say, not because they're in an abusive marriage or something. They say, you know what? I'm, I'm leaving because um, I, I have to leave my wife and I have to leave my child because after all, if I stayed, just the dynamic, I'm really, I'm really leaving for this younger model. I'm doing it for my child. Don't, don't you understand? The happiest version of me is the one that my child ought to say. No, that is not how any of this works. Again, as a father of three, soon to be four, got to tell you, you're constantly sacrificing your personal authenticity and happiness on behalf of your children. It's just a thing you do all the time. But let's be real. What we are now doing is we are reverse engineering how parenting, how relationships are supposed to be done. Everyone is out there to validate you. You are not out there to validate anyone else, right? It's not your job to create relationships with other people with give and take. It is their job to mirror you. It is the perfect tale of narcissists. We are now stuck looking in the mirror at ourselves constantly. And if we don't like what we see, then we insist that we get a new mirror and that everyone around us mirror back to us what it is that, that we are. By the way, if there's any data that contradicts this, we then go after the authors of the data. So there is a brand new study out from Northwestern University, psychology professor Michael Bailey. According to Daily Wire, he analyzed survey data from 1,655 parents of youth and young adult children who identified as the opposite sex or non-binary. The survey data was compiled by the anonymous support group Parents of Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria Kids, an organization that collects horror stories from parents whose children struggled with gender dysphoria. The data collected came from families of kids who began to identify as trans between the ages of 11 and 21. Bailey's study found gender dysphoria impacted girls much more often than boys. 75% of gender dysphoric children were biological females. Now, again, that is a massive shift. It is complete social contagion. This is why you don't let your kids watch this crap on YouTube, because if they do, it creates social contagion. Girls who feel insecure in their bodies or uncomfortable in their bodies, namely nearly every teenage girl, start to think, well, maybe the reason I'm feeling uncomfortable is because I'm actually a member of the opposite sex. All my friends say I am. Then they go to the local gender clinic without any sort of screening procedure. They're handed testosterone, which makes them feel, as testosterone does, more confident and more aggressive. And then they're like, oh, I feel better now. Well, you do very, very, very temporarily. Girls were much more likely to socially transition or more in order to match their gender identity. A history of mental health issues was a defining trait of most children who later struggled with gender dysphoria. And not, not a complete shock here. According to what was happening at Tavistock Gender Clinic, they're basically preying on kids who suffered from pre-existing autism. We'll get to more on the study in just one moment, because again, the cultural mores require that you bow before the lie, not before the data. First, the war in Ukraine is continuing, and many elderly Jews and Holocaust survivors have fled their homes. They're now seeking a place to live. They're in desperate need of life's basic needs like food and water. Well, the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is on the spot. They've been in Ukraine every day since the war began. The fellowship's partners and volunteers are on the ground right now. They need their help to reach even more Jewish lives with life-saving food. Not only are they helping elderly Jews in harm's way in Ukraine, but the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is also caring for orphaned children, families, and Holocaust survivors living in extreme poverty throughout Israel and the former Soviet Union. These are people who are in desperate need right now. We've worked out a special matching opportunity for you. Your gift will double in impact right now. Your tax-deductible gift is multiplied times two to help provide twice the necessities and save lives today. Head on over to benforthefellowship.org or call 800-331-3737 to make a gift of just 25 bucks to the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. It's you doing something amazing for someone else. That's benforthefellowship.org or call 800-331-3737. Help people out on the ground in Ukraine right now. Again, 800-331-3737 or benforthefellowship.org and your gift will be multiplied times two. Okay, so this study from a Northwestern University researcher found pre-existing mental health issues were common. Youths with these issues were more likely than those without them to have socially and medically transitioned. Parents reported they'd often felt pressured by clinicians to affirm their child's new gender and support their transition. According to the parents, children's mental health deteriorated considerably after social transition, which of course is not a shock at all. It is not a shock at all. Suicidal ideation, depression, these rates are sky high for kids who identify as members of the opposite sex or gender non-binary. And when you usher kids into this world, and when you socially transition them, you're not making them healthier, you're making them significantly less durable, less able to face life challenges, and more bought into a lie that inevitably is going to shatter on the rocks of reality. Parents 
of ROGD kids. Again, that's rapid onset gender dysphoria kids. Say the study backs up its assertions that one of the prime causes of gender dysphoria and transgender identification in young people is social contagion. Girls are especially susceptible to suggestion and groupthink influenced by their social circles, the group said. And again, this is part of the game. The more people you can get to identify as transgender or gender non-conforming, and this is the push on social media, this is the push among left-wing politicians, the more you can say it's a real phenomenon. If it turns out that it's a very fringe thing, a fringe phenomenon, well then, you can say, well, this is fringe. This is not This is not real. A lot of this is being driven by social contagion. But the more people who do it, the more it reifies itself. And then you can say, no, 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 it's a real thing. It's a thing that's really happening out there. And not only is it happening, it's absolutely real. The group said in a press release, quote, these youth are most likely using gender dysphoria to describe general feelings of dysphoria. They have no other name for it and do not understand. Transitioning does not help them. It can only cause irreversible harm and make things much, much worse. In a footnote to its release, the parents of our OGD kids also knocked the Washington Post. They published a, an article earlier on last month suggesting trans treatment lent to happier outcomes from people who identify as transgender. But that, of course, is not true. Okay, it, as this group points out, on every question relating to mental health and social functioning, the group rated themselves as worse off than the total population surveyed, which, of course, is indeed the case. And this is all about society shutting down the discussion. You're not even supposed to have the discussion in public. We have to take great care on social media not to be banned, which is why we very often will refer people over to Daily Wire Plus if you want to hear the uncensored version of the show. Same thing that many people on, on the onlines do. Our, our show Morning Wire, by the way, has covered this particular study in depth. You should go check that out over on their podcast feed. It's called Morning Wire. But this all th this is the theme. The theme is that if you mention this sort of stuff, then you are supposed to be shut up. And you have to go along with it or it means that you're a transphobe like if Mr. Beast had said to Chris Tyson, listen, dude, take some time off, figure out your stuff, and then we'll talk later about your career. But he's not allowed to do that. Just as Jamie Reed, who is a, a whistleblower on a gender clinic over in Missouri, says that she was on the Trigonometry pod podcast. She's, she's a left-wing lesbian, is my understanding. And, uh, and she said, we weren't even able to say that we have concerns about patients. We were just supposed to immediately greenlight whatever they wanted. We were pretty much putting anybody on testosterone at 13 and a half if that's what they wanted. It was getting to the point where we were harming more patients that we were helping just by the numbers. What I am not in agreement with is this push to rapid medicalization of children. And it got to the point in the center where there was a, an actual directive that we were no longer allowed to use the phrase, I have concerns about a patient. Yeah, that's insane. If you can't say I have concerns about a patient, what are you doing in the field of psychology or psychiatry? That's literally the entire field. If you have no concerns about the patient, why is the patient there in the first place? Absolute absurdity. But this is why it's so imperative. And when you see people who are outside this game, who buy into it or full month the game, you actually have to take your business away from them, whether it's not watching a Mr. Beast video or whether it's ceasing to drink Bud Light, which again, guys, it's urine water. I don't know why you want to drink it in the first place. So Bud Light, as we all know, over the last couple of weeks came under severe fire because they decided that would be an amazingly smart marketing move to hire Dylan Mulvaney, a dude who pretends that he is a lady, in order to market its beer for poor white people, which is what Bud Light is. Because if you can afford anything better, you definitely afford something better than Bud Light. So Bud Light, is now trying to walk this one back, as they should, because it turns out that they lost like a lot of market value almost immediately following the Dylan Mulvaney debacle. Now, their stock has recovered somewhat because, again, people don't tend to hold boycotts for very long, but this is why it's important to actually hold the line. So, Anheuser busch put out a ridiculously weak statement. They said, quote, our responsibility to America, this is from the head of, of anheuser busch the CEO, a guy named Whitworth, quote, as the CEO of a company, Founded in America's heartland more than 165 years ago, I'm responsible for ensuring every consumer feels proud of the beer we brew. We're honored to be part of the fabric of this community. Anheuser-Busch employs more than 18,000 people, and our independent distributors employ an additional 47,000 valued colleagues. We have thousands of partners, millions of fans, a proud history supporting communities, military first responders, sports fans, and hardworking Americans everywhere. We never intended to be part of a discussion that divides people. We are in the business of bringing people together over a beer. My time serving this country taught me the importance of accountability and the values upon which America was founded. Freedom, hard work, respect for one another. As CEO of Anheuser-Busch, I'm focused on building and protecting our remarkable history and heritage. I care deeply about this country, this company, our brands, our partners. I spent much of my time traveling across America, listening to, learning from our customers, distributors, and others. 
Moving forward, I will continue to work tirelessly to bring great beers to consumers across our nation. That is an absolutely meaningless statement. This made the left mad, by the way. An absolutely meaningless statement that doesn't actually back off of advertising with Dylan Mulvaney apparently made the left fighting angry. But it shows that Anheuser-Busch is actually on the retreat a little bit. They don't want this fight in the same way that Disney has been on the retreat socially since people decided they don't wish to invest in their product. We'll see if Disney continues to double down. The great suspicion is that in Frozen 4, they'll make Elsa a lesbian. If they, by the way, if they do that, it is the end of Disney as a, as a company. Predict it. You can write it down. It is April 17th. If they do that in Frozen 4, it will destroy Disney. Like, thoroughly destroy it. And we'll get to more on that momentarily. First, let's talk about your sleep quality. It's easy to lose sleep over the bad things happening in the world, but you need to have a great mattress made just for you. So everything else in your life, thank God, is now personalized. You can personalize pretty much everything in your life. Your coffee order. You don't just go to the coffee house and be like, whatever you got on tap. Instead, you don't go to the you don't go to the local pub and be like, whatever you, you get on tap might be Bud Light. Instead, what you do is you actually go and get a mattress that is made just for you. Helix is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, even a mattress made just for kids. I've had my Helix sleep mattress for years now, which is great because if I have the wrong type of mattress, I get actually bad back pain. So I need it firm and breathable. That's exactly what Helix Sleep actually does. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Take their two-minute sleep quiz. Find the perfect mattress for your body and sleep type. Not the kind that I want, the kind that you want. For a limited time, Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. It's their best offer yet. Hurry on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben with Helix. Better sleep starts right now. They've got financing option, flexible payment plans. They make it so a great night's sleep is never far away. Go check them out right now. Helixsleep.com slash Ben. Okay, so Anheuser-Busch was trying to walk this one back. According to the UK Daily Mail, Budweiser has released a patriotic new ad featuring its iconic Clydesdale horses just two weeks after the Dylan Mulvaney Bud Light deal sparked huge backlash. The one-minute spot was released on social media Friday, featured shots of the iconic Clydesdales galloping across the country in open fields past landmarks, including the Lincoln Memorial and the New York City skyline. And then a narrator says Budweiser is a story bigger than beer, right? They're, they're trying to, it better be bigger than beer because the beer isn't very good. The ad for the beer is obviously a pivot to return to sort of the values that originally Bud Light was identified with. This is in stark difference, says the UK Daily Mail. Two Bud Light's doomed partnership with trans influencer Mulvaney, which ended in a lukewarm apology from the firm CEO. Now, I didn't really apologize, obviously, but it was a movement away from all of that, which is why it's important to actually pressure corporations that do this, which is kind of why it's unbelievable to me, like truly unbelievable, the pusillanimity, the cowardice, like the pure cowardice of the RNC and Donald Trump Jr. on this issue. Now, listen, I, a lot of, I like a lot of things about Donald Trump Jr. I've met him, very nice guy. Donald Trump Jr., on his podcast, suggested that we should stop boycotting Bud Light, that we should continue to drink Bud Light, which is a weird take. It's a very weird take, actually. And there are some reasons for that. So here, Donald Trump Jr. said this. The memes have been so good. I'm sitting there chomping. I'd be like, I want it. But like when I actually look into it, I'm not going to blame the whole company for the inaction or the stupidity of someone in a marketing campaign that got woke as hell. The company itself doesn't participate in the same leftist nonsense as the other big conglomerates. Frankly, they don't participate in the same woke garbage that other people in the beer industry actually do, who are significantly worse offenders when I looked into it. Okay, so what? I mean, what? So first of all, this notion that you shouldn't pressure corporations, especially if those corporations give to Republicans, unlike other corporations, is ridiculous. Those are exactly the people you should pressure. Why would a left-wing corporation that gets all of its money from the left wing ever listen to you? It's where you have leverage. If you can't keep the corporations that actually are fairly balanced in line, what are you going to do with the far-left corporations that don't give a bleep about your priorities? It makes no sense. Now, it does tie in with the fact that you know Donald Trump Jr. is on board with the don't trans the kids stuff, but he has also said in the past that, quote, I don't give a bleep, dude. If you're an adult and you want to be trans and you do it, great. If you're happy, you're productive, I don't give a bleep. I'm fairly liberal on the issue. I mean, the reality is that for, for those of us who don't believe in the transgender agenda, the very idea that a man can become a woman and a woman can become a man is absurd on its face. It's significantly worse for children because anything that you do that is bad is worse when you do it to kids. But if you're a 30-year-old man and you say that you are a woman and some doctor decides to do mutilating surgery on you, I think there are values like truth that are actually higher than consent. Okay, if you consent to chop off your arm and a doctor does it for you, that doesn't make it okay. There's still a problem there. But put that aside, the, the basic sort of notion that you are supposed to leave alone Bud Light or Budweiser because Budweiser is, is not quite as lefty as other companies, 
It makes no sense at all on just a pure leverage level. Meanwhile, the RNC is doing the same exact thing. So the RN, the NRC, they, 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 the National Republican Congressional Committee, they actually quietly backed off of attacking Bud Light. Why? Because it turns out that Bud has given some money to the RNC. According to the Daily Beast, the new move by the NRCC is to delete a fundraising page that took aim at Anheuser-Busch. Now, okay, now I understand why they're doing that. These are money-making organizations. And this is something that we should all remember in politics. This is true right, left, and center. All of the organizations, the RNC, the DNC, the NRCC, the, D, the, the DNCC, or the DCCC, rather, all of those organizations are repositories for money grabs. They are not there to define values. All they care about is the bottom line, how much money they take in. So if there's a corporation, that corporation giving money uses its leverage against the NRCC. It's not the opposite way around. It's not that the NRCC is using its leverage against corporations. The corporations are using their leverage on the NRCC, which is why it's important for you as the consumer to exert your leverage on the companies, because otherwise they're going to shape from the inside the agenda of the NRCC. You want to know why a bunch of Republican senators voted in favor of enshrining same-sex marriage? It's because voters didn't do their job. It is because the Republican Party over and over again on social issues has been eaten from the inside out by a donor class that does not actually share the values of the base of the Republican Party. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why, for example, there is a major donor, supposedly, who is now going anti-DeSantis in the wake of his six-week abortion ban that was passed and signed into law here in Florida. This donor happens to be a major Trump donor, by the way. This donor was featured by Maggie Haberman, who is, of course, very tr tight with, with Donald Trump on a personal level. He's, he's kind of her, her pen pal or phone pal. And... Um, and she wrote an entire piece about this guy who was very upset with DeSantis. Why? Because DeSantis is too socially conservative. One thing you have to understand about the GOP donor class, by and large, they're significantly more socially liberal than the general population of the United States and way more left wing when it comes to social policy than the base of the Republican Party. This is the thing that everyone in these sort of chattering classes doesn't understand about Trump's campaign in 2016. Trump's campaign in 2016 was not about trade. Trump's campaign in 2016 was not about racism. Trump's campaign in 2016 was, there's a left-wing assault on your social values, and you should not allow that to happen. The big gap between the middle of the country and the coasts is not on economics. The big gap between the middle of the country, red state areas and blue state areas, is actually on the social issues. Those issues matter to an awful lot of people, especially a lot of people who happen to go to church. But the donor class doesn't believe that stuff. This is why if you actually go inside the Republican donor class, and I've been in a lot of rooms with these people, the Republican donor class is disproportionately libertarian. They're people who are so, this is how they get along with, with all their left-wing friends in major coastal areas because coastal Republican donors give an outsized share of Republican donations. Those coastal Republican donors are people who go to their friends and they're like, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm not so comfortable with this pro-life thing. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty on board with same-sex marriage, even trans stuff like, yeah, you know, it's fine with me. It's really that I want lower taxes. That agenda is coming from a donor class that exists in New York, LA, some areas of Miami, Right? That donor class is not in line with the rest of the Republican Party base. So it's not particularly a shock that the NRCC and the RNC are now calling off the dogs when it comes to Anheuser-Busch. Again, major donors to these organizations are not on board with the socially conservative agenda of the Republican Party. And that's why it's important for you as the base to stand up to that. You want to talk about the, the distinction between the quote-unquote establishment and the anti-establishment? This would be it. You know, the, in, the, in the sort of Reagan three-legged stool that always described the, the conservative movement, the Republican Party, that Reagan three-legged stool was hawkish on foreign policy, laissez-faire on economics, and socially conservative. The piece that was always uncomfortable for the elite was not the first two, it was the third. It was all those kind of weird, weird, creepy Christians who, who like believe in the Bible and like Judeo-Christian morality. That, that's kind of awkward. We'll, we'll, like we'll get on board with them, but we're not really on board with them. They're all, they, they, make us, they make us feel yucky on the inside. The donor class in the Republican Party is very much along those lines. Do not listen to the donor class. They bring you nothing but failure, especially on the most crucial issues. Because here's my view. Yes, economic issues matter an awful lot. I'm a property rights guy. I believe in free markets more strongly than pretty much anybody on the right. But in terms of the social values that undergird free markets and undergird working societies, social values matter more than any of that. If you destroy the social fabric, if you destroy the family, if you destroy basic notions of male and female dichotomy, None of the rest of that exists. All that stuff is, is scaffolding that is built on a shaky foundation. The foundation has to be the social conservatism. If that goes away, the rest of it just collapses inward. That's what you're seeing across Western societies. The big problem in Western societies, yeah, they're socialistic economic structures. But the real problem is there are no kids. There are no families. You don't have the basis to actually build a thing. So the fact that you have you know, Donald Trump Jr. saying, don't go after Anheuser-Busch or the RNC saying that, if Anheuser-Busch wants to get back in the good graces, 
of the people who consume its product, maybe they ought to actually say, we apologize for buying into the lie that a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man. We should not have stepped into this social battle in the first place. What is amazing about all this, of course, is how the media lie about it. We'll get to that momentarily. First, let's talk about the fact that if you run a small business, you need to plan ahead. It is just an important thing. One of the best ways to do that is by using stamps.com to help mail and ship. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels right from your home or office. It's ready to go in just minutes, so you can get back to running your business sooner. Stamps.com offers rates you can't find anywhere else. They'll offer up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. Plus, they automatically tell you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over a million businesses. Get access to the shipping services you need to run your business directly from your computer. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. You can print postage wherever you do business. They even send you a free scale. So you'll have everything you need to get started. Here at Daily Wire, we don't waste our time. We save money. We save time. You should do the same. Set your business up for success. Get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code Shapiro for a special offer. It includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and free digital scale. No long-term commitments, no contracts. Just go to stamps.com. Click that microphone at the top of the page. Enter code Shapiro. Again, that's the way we save money here at Daily Wire. You should do exactly the same thing. Head on over to stamps.com. Click that mic at the top of the page. Enter promo code Shapiro. Also, hard to believe it's been less than a year since Matt Walsh released the most important documentary of the last 10 years, What is a Woman? And a lot has transpired since then. What is a Woman? did help spark a national debate about what our children are being taught, where this country is headed. If you haven't had a chance to see What is a Woman Again, the best documentary of the last decade, I have some excellent news for you. This is your last chance to get 30% off your Daily Wire Plus membership when you use code WOMAN. If you haven't seen the film or you know somebody who hasn't, tell them to watch it. It's time more people came back to the side of truth and reality to watch What is a Woman. Join right now at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code WOMAN. Save 30% off your membership. Okay, meanwhile, the New York Times is doing what it can do to try to pretend that what conservatives are saying about the trans issue, it's actually an offensive culture war. This is the thing that the left loves to do is they provoke a culture war. And then when there's a response from the right, they're like, how dare you start this culture war? So there's an entire article in the New York Times titled How a Campaign Against Transgender Rights Mobilized Conservatives. Defeated on same-sex marriage, the religious right went searching for an issue that would re-energize supporters and donors. The campaign that followed has stunned political leaders across the spectrum. Well, no, actually what happened is that after same-sex marriage, everyone thought this was done. After same-sex marriage, everyone right, left, and center was like, well, the left has achieved its utmost goal, which is to pretend that a male-male dyad is the same thing as a male-female dyad. Now we can all move on with our lives. And then the left was like, well, what if we actually use that in order to cram down on religious institutions our views of men and women? And then what if we suggest that because male-male dyads are the same as male-female dyads, that male and female are actually interchangeable and that men can become women and women can become men and that your children can be taught this. Basically, the left went in search of a new civil rights issue. This is what they do. Because the left is inherently a revolution that can never stop, they have to find the next revolutionary civil rights issue. They ran out of them. And so they're like, what if we come up with the idea that a man can be a woman, a woman can be a man, and we start cramming that down on small school children with the gender unicorn? And the right was like, what in the actual F? And then the New York Times like, you guys went searching for this issue, didn't you? You went searching for it. And once you see the face tattoo, tattoo syndrome that I've described, you can't unsee it. This is where the left, again, like that barista at Starbucks with the crazy face tattoo that goes around the eye and then down the chin. And then you look at the face tattoo and they're like, why are you looking at that? How dare you look at it? Why are you starting to fight? What are you looking at? It's like your face tattoo that you put there for me to look at. That's what you, you declared the war. And then when we respond, because it is offensive and terrible when it comes to, you know, transing the kids, then you say, well, you guys started the fight. So the New York Times has an entire, the entire article is just a gaslighting example par excellence. Quote, when the Supreme Court declared a constitutional right to same-sex marriage nearly eight years ago, social conservatives were set adrift. The ruling stripped them of an issue they had used to galvanize rank and file supporters and big donors. It left them searching for a cause that, like opposing gay marriage, would rally the base and raise the movement's profile on the national stage. We knew we needed to find an issue candidates were comfortable talking about, said Terry Schilling, president of American Principles Project. We threw everything at the wall. What is stuck somewhat unexpectedly is the issue of transgender identity, particularly among young people. The campaign since has, has been both organic and deliberate, has even gained speed since Trump an ideological ally left the White House. Since then, at least 20 states, all controlled by Republicans, have enacted laws that reach well beyond the initial debates over access to bathrooms and into medical treatments, participation in sports policies on discussing gender in schools. It's a strange world to live in, said Ari Drennan, LGBTQ program director for Media Matters, a liberal media monitoring group that tracks legislation. As a transgender woman, she said, she feels unwelcome in whole swaths of the country where states have attacked her right just to exist. I love that they are now going as experts to Media Matters, a left-wing propaganda group. But this is what the media do on a constant basis. There's an actual problem, but if you pay attention to the problem, it's because you're a bigot of some sort. Okay, speaking of this exact approach, we have to take a look at what happened over the weekend in Chicago. So over the weekend in Chicago, Chicago is a disaster area. It is just a disaster area. 
So according to ABC7 in Chicago, 15 people were arrested after large groups gathered downtown and two teenagers were shot near Millennium Park on Saturday night. This is according to Chicago police. The shooting happened in the 0 to 100 block of East Washington Street about 9 p.m. Police said a 16-year-old boy was shot in the arm, a 17-year-old boy was shot in the leg. Both victims were transported to Northwestern Hospital in fair condition. There's no one in custody. Police are currently investigating. According to Chicago PD, they said officers responded to several large groups of juveniles and young adults who were, quote, engaging in reckless and disruptive behavior and putting themselves and the public at risk for harm. But the officers were completely overwhelmed. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people who are engaging in looting and vandalism. Officers arrested nine adults and six juveniles only. We have some video from the actual from the actual ransacking that happened over the weekend on the loop. Here's some of the video. Large numbers of young people crowding the area of the loop from Michigan Avenue to Clark Street and could be seen jumping on parked cars and smashing windows. Two times, groups of teens were also seen punching, kicking, and stomping on someone on the ground. In the midst of it all, shots were fired just after nine, leaving two teens injured. A 17-year-old boy was hit in the leg, and a 16-year-old boy was shot in the arm. Yeah, well, that is just one piece of the video. There's tons of video that has now emerged of this craziness on the loop. Here's some more. This is downtown Chicago. <laughs> Fights happening in the middle of the street, people wailing on each other. Just barbaric behavior in the middle of the streets. I mean, I'm not sure what else to call that. And all this is happening, and it's just a disaster area in the middle of downtown Chicago. And by the way, the craziness in Chicago is not relegated to the incident on the loop. Then shots get fired, people are running away. It, obviously, things are well under control. Mayor Lori Lightfoot has done a spectacular job. And there you have it, like two police officers for hundreds of young people who are going around and... Uh, committing acts of vandalism, getting violent with people, jumping on top of cars and all the rest. There, there's no way to control the city when you don't have enough cops on the streets. And again, it's not just in downtown Chicago. Over the weekend, video emerged from the border between Forest Park and Oak Park, which is a neighborhood in Chicago. And this video is just insane. I mean, this is, this is happening in broad daylight in Chicago. Okay, so there's a woman who's screaming at another woman in a car. And she's saying, what are you going to do, hit me? And the woman's like, yeah. So she uh, she takes her car there at a gas station. There's a man who opens the door. The woman tries to drive away. And she decides to hit the gas. She slams it into another car. She drags the guy. And then she takes off down the street. And her car gets hit by another car and flips completely over. In the middle of the street. This is like something out of Grand Theft Auto. It's absurd. This stuff is happening just in the middle of broad daylight in Chicago. People screaming at each other on the streets. I mean, it's just nuts. And then all the local leaders are like, well, we can't do anything about this. That'd be bad. Why, why, should, why, should we, why should we do anything about this? So do the local leaders in Chicago decide that they are going to you know, come together to try to bring down the crime rate by, for example, encouraging fathers to stay in the home, restructuring welfare so that welfare does not benefit single mothers above married mothers. You know, take measures that might actually encourage people to form the basic family units that actually enshrine behavior in children. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to yell at Walmart. So Walmart opened up in Chatham and, uh, and then Walmart closed in Chatham. Why? Well, because they were getting ransacked and looted and, and stolen from so often they couldn't make a profit. This happened in San Francisco also. You're seeing big box stores all over the country closed down in high crime areas, which of course is not a shock. It turns out that you can't run a profit when people are just stealing stuff off your shelves. So what did local leaders do? Well, they showed up demanding that the store remain open two days after corporate officials announced they would close the store this weekend. So uh, here, here are some of the local officials. We have food deserts. Yes, right. sir. And we wonder why. Yes, sir. Our communities look like they look. Well, Speak that the we truth. have violence every single day. Speak the truth. Yes. Yes, Lord. It is just not on us. Yeah. It is on the corporate citizens that come into our community yeah. and ravage our community. Yeah. 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 And Walmart. You should be absolutely ashamed of yourself. You are the reason that our communities lack the investment that they have. We should not have to go out of our communities to find jobs. We should not have to go out of our communities to get medicine. We should not go out of our communities to be able to shop. We should be able to do all of this in our community. Right here. Oh, we, we, we should magically these stores should appear and they should run a loss because parents aren't watching their kids or teaching them not to steal things from the stores. And these, these are called consequences. They're the natural thing that happens when you screw things up. 
That, that, that is what happens. But apparently, it's corporate America that is to blame. Lori Lightfoot, the outgoing mayor of Chicago, she issued a statement saying in part, quote, parents and guardians must know where their children are and be responsible for their action. Meanwhile, the incoming mayor, and, and again, this is just a perfect example of the H.L. Mencken line, that democracy is the theory that the average voter knows what he wants and deserves to get it good and hard. They voted this guy in. They voted in Brandon Johnson to replace Lori Lightfoot. They're like, ah, Lori Lightfoot, she did a terrible job. Let's get rid of her and replace her with male Lori Lightfoot, Brandon Johnson. He's a Cook County commissioner, incoming mayor. And here he was refusing to suggest that looting was even taking place in the loop. How do we make sure, the question is, how do we make sure that people can eat? Look, no one is going to condone, um, you know, behavior that, that quite frankly speaks to a level of desperation. So you're not, people you're not condoning out. looting? I'm saying that people are acting out of desperation. We don't want a society that is acting out of desperation. But you have to pay attention to the cries that people have. By so you're, you're not that, condoning looting? Th th there's no way to, to, to embrace that. What I'm saying is you can't condone the looting that corporations continue to do every single day when they take tax dollars from black, brown, white folks all over the city of Chicago so that they can turn a profit. That is three separate times the incoming mayor of Chicago refused to condemn looting. Three separate times saying that they're doing it out of desperation. No, they are not. Do you see the clothes that those kids are wearing in Chicago? They are not wearing rags. Okay, these are not like homeless street urchins from a Dickens novel. These are people who have a fairly decent lifestyle. They're not starving. When I say fairly decent, I mean like they have an apartment in like the penthouse in New York. I mean, they are fed. They have cell phones. They have microwaves. They have cars. They, like these are people who are, they're not, they're not, Jean Valjean breaking a window to steal a loaf of bread for a child. That's not what's happening here. They're looting upscale stores. They're stealing pharmaceuticals from Walmart. Okay, that's what's happening here. And the incoming mayor of Chicago is like, well, we can't condemn that. These are desperate people. He put out a statement, quote, in no way do I condone the destructive activity we saw in the loop. It is unacceptable. It has no place in our city. However, it is not constructive to demonize youth who have otherwise been starved of opportunities in their own communities. Our city must work together to create spaces for youth to gather safely and responsibly under adult guidance and supervision to ensure that every part of our city remains welcome for both residents and visitors. This is one aspect of my comprehensive approach to improve public safety and make Chicago livable forever. Ah, midnight basketball, that'll do the job. It's not about the breakdown of family structure. It's not about paying people to stay home. It's not about removing cops from the streets to enforce the law. Nope, gotta have some midnight basketball. That'll fix the problem. And if you, if you disagree, it's because you are a racist. That is why. It's because you're racist. Again, you must never pay attention to the actual problems in American society. Instead, you have to call everyone who does pay attention to those problems a bigot in some form or another. We'll get to more on that in just one second. First, you know, men, we hate going to the doctor. You have to make the appointment, spend half your day sitting around the waiting room. And then sometimes guys have to endure uncomfortable conversations about their body with somebody else. Well, Rex MD is FDA approved. It's the most trusted leader in men's telehealth. It's fast, simple, and cheap. You can access your US licensed Rex MD physician anytime you need it. RexMD makes it easy and inexpensive to get generic and branded Viagra or Cialis online. No waiting rooms, no embarrassing trips to the doctor, no insurance, no copays. Did you know that Viagra can cost 90 bucks a pill? Well, RexMD has the generic version for as low as $2 a pill. Fill out their online medical questionnaire. A doctor will review your situation and, if appropriate, prescribe you medication. Your medication will ship right to your door with free two-day shipping. It's fast, simple, and cheap. Plus, you can access your U.S.-licensed RexMD physician anytime you need afterwards. RexMD has already helped over 300,000 dudes gain confidence quickly and conveniently, and they're here to help you as well. Take advantage of the best deal yet at RexMD.com slash Ben. Save up to 90% off by paying only $2 per dosage. That's RexMD.com slash Ben for up to 90% off. Go to RexMD.com for more details and safety information. Again, check them out, RexMD.com. So again, the rule on the left is that if you actually pay attention to an issue, then they call you a racist. That's the way all of this works. Because to actually pay attention to the issue gets into uncomfortable conversations about what people ought to do, for example, in order to prevent crime. So it is amazing how the media will pay attention to certain types of shooting, but not other types of shooting. So whenever there is a mass shooting that involves white people, whether it's a white shooter and minority victims, or whether it is white victims and a white shooter, typically that gets major media coverage. There is almost no media coverage when there is a mass shooting involving black shooters and black victims. That just does not even chart. It doesn't chart. Because again, the media have a narrative. Their media narrative is that it's gun ownership that is the problem. That it is not a function of culture. It is not a function of family structure. It's not a function of anything else why people get violent. People would only get violent out of desperation, right? This is the case that the new incoming idiot mayor of Chicago, Brandon Johnson, is making. That the reason that people shoot each other or the reason that people loot the loop is because they are desperate and in need. And that's a systemic, system-wide problem. 
made everything for the left points toward either a socialist solution or a restrictionist solution. These are the only two solutions. On the right, we tend toward solutions that bear toward, you know, individual decision making and incentive structures for individuals. So that usually involves rebuilding social fabric, rebuilding family structure, looking at what are the economic incentives that make people do the things that they do or incentivize them to do bad things. Okay, so the, the, today's example comes courtesy of the Daily Mail. Apparently, a high school football standout was among four killed in a mass shooting in a small town, Alabama area, where more than 20 people were shot at a Sweet 16 celebration for the victim's sister. Philstavius Dowdell, a senior set to graduate in a matter of weeks, had been celebrating his sister Alexis's birthday Saturday night at Mahogany Masterpiece Dance Studio in Dadeville when the first shots rang out following what cops suspect was a fight. The teen was awarded a full scholarship to Jacksonville State back this past February and is the first victim to be formally identified. Earlier in the day, state investigators probing the shooting confirmed in a statement there have been four fatalities. So four people dead. Apparently, again, more than 20 injured. This is not receiving the sort of national media coverage as most of the mass shootings. And the reason it's not receiving the sort of media coverage of most of these mass shootings is because the unfortunate problem with the murder rate in the United States and the gun homicide rate in the United States is that it is largely happening inside the black community. It is largely happening because black people are shooting other black people. That is an uncomfortable truth. It's just statistical reality. That, that has nothing to do with the inherent quality of race. As I've said 1,000 times before, it has to do with the conjunction of socioeconomic factors that range from lack of fathers in the home to lack of educational opportunities to lack of cops on the streets in these areas, specifically because the left keeps yelling at having too many cops in black areas because the cops are racist or something, which is why I've seen a huge spike in the homicide rate in virtually every major American city since 2014 and the Ferguson riots. Okay, so here is a stat. And the stat should shock you because we're constantly talking in the United States about homicide deaths in the United States and how terrible the homicide death rate is in the United States. It's so high, it's so crazy, it's so awful. There is a problem. When you strike the homicide deaths per 100,000 population by race in the United States, the differences are stark and shocking. So 538 did an analysis of homicide deaths per 100,000 population from 2010 to 2012. And there's no reason to think that these numbers have changed in any major way over the course of the ensuing decade. Probably they've gotten worse considering the increased amount of crime from 2014 and up that seems to be relegated largely to America's major cities, which are disproportionately black. So according to this chart, again, this is 538. If the black United States were its own country, it would have a homicide death rate of 19.4 per 100,000 population. 19.4. The white U.S. population has a homicide death rate of 2.5 per 100,000 population. Which means that black Americans are killed at 12 times the rate of people in other developed countries. In some cases, if you're looking at like the UK, you're looking at almost 20 times the rate as in other developed countries. White American citizens are kind of on par with Finland, Israel, lower than Chile, lower than Latvia, lower than Cuba. And so what does this mean? It means that if we were to look at solutions for the gun homicide rate, we would actually have to look at systemic failure inside major American cities that disproportionately affect black people. That's what we'd have to actually look at. But the media have an aversion to looking at those sorts of things because we have declared that all life choices are equivalent and that all family structures are equivalent. A single mom with a kid on welfare is totally equivalent to married mom and dad with three kids not on welfare. Same exact issue, same exact thing. That, of course, is untrue. The only time, in fact, that the left will mention the issue of race is when there is a law of general applicability that they think is bad. Then all of a sudden they start mentioning race. So for example, did MSNBC have anything to say about this major shooting in Alabama over the weekend? Did they have anything to say really about the loop over the weekend? This huge violence that was, if you look at the video, it appears to be virtually all young black teenagers who are running through the loop and committing acts of violence, which is why you saw the incoming mayor basically poo-poo it. Have serious doubts that if there were an all white teenage audience running through the loop and ransacking stores, he'd be like, oh, this is systemic poverty. In any case, what do they focus on when it comes to race? They focus on abortion law in Florida. So here's MSNBC's Katie Fang and a, and a guest talking about how black women are going to die in Florida because of lack of quote unquote abortion access. Now, nobody ever seems to point out on the left that a disproportionate number of black babies are killed in utero in the United States, that more black babies are killed than born in utero every single year in New York City. Those black kids don't matter at all. But apparently the, the laws that are really a problem for black people are abortion laws. It, it's not that, we don't have to solve the gun homicide problem 
in major American cities disproportionately affecting black people. We don't have to worry about that. We have to worry about abortion law. What are your constituents saying about a six-week abortion ban in the state of Florida? They're saying that it's too much. They're saying that the state of Florida, we're, we're doing way too much as government overreach. And when you look at what just happened with Anya and, and Shanae, what we're no, noticing is that that's the reality. Black women are going to die. That is State Senator Chevron Jones saying that black women are going to die. He obviously doesn't care very much about the, you know, unborn black kids who do die every year in mass numbers. First of all, Black people are not even being born thanks to abortion in extraordinary numbers in the United States. And young black men are actually being born to die because the gun homicide rate among young black men is extraordinarily high. But nobody's going to focus in on that. Because you focus in on that, you might have to have uncomfortable systemic conversations about how these cities are being run and what the incentive structures are. Instead, we're going to pretend that unless you agree with the left, you're some sort of racist, which is exactly what they're doing in Tennessee. So Tennessee passes a law to actually shore up security at a bunch of schools. And Tennessee State Representative Justin Pearson, who's been cosplaying the revolution, he says, we're living in a gun violence epidemic. Well, um, why are you using as an example of the gun violence? Why is the example, the best example, like the apex example of gun violence, this shooting at a Nashville church when the disproportionate number of black of, of gun homicides in the United States are affecting young black men who are being shot by other young black men. The reason is because then you get to claim that the solution is taking guns away from everybody, which of course is not the solution. The reality is we have a Republican Party that is much more concerned about how they can take control over people's lives and preservation of the NRA's ability to write our legislation than actually doing anything to protect our communities or make them safer. In Tennessee, what we have seen, even in the wake of the shooting at the National Covenant School, where three children lost their lives who were nine years old and three administrators, where folks went to a bank in Louisville, Kentucky, and lost their lives due to assault rifles and weapons being way too easily accessible. We are living in a gun violence epidemic because we have a preponderance of legislation that refuses to deal with the proliferation of weapons that are in our communities. So first of all, I don't enjoy this version of Justin Pearson nearly as much as uh, crazed, scream, shouting, you know, crazy arms, Justin Pearson. Uh, th that guy's much more entertaining. But again, avoid the central issue, because if you don't avoid the central issue, you might have to talk about uncomfortable things and consider the possibility that all of your solutions are destined for failure. Now, meanwhile, leading up to 2024, the left has decided on its theme. The theme for 2024 is going to be abortion. It's going to be abortion all the time. Now, you can see why the left is focusing on this theme. The reason the left is focusing on the theme for 2024 is they can't point to the wonderful performance of Joe Biden. He's done a terrible job. His job approval rating is in the low 40 percent. He does not appear to be sentient any longer. Every day he appears to be degrading in front of our eyes. It really is quite shocking and ugly. So they've decided they're going to focus in on abortion. The reason they're doing this is because if they look at states like Michigan, where there was basically an abortion ban on the table or an enshrinement of abortion law in the Constitution on the table, it really helped Democrats. In the same way that in 2004, actually, rather, in the same way that is in 2008, the B Barack Obama probably won primaries based on the fact that there was also on the ballot in a pro-traditional marriage amendment that black Americans disproportionately voted for in the state of California. In the same way, Democrats would love to get on the ballot abortion, like in every state. They'd love to make the next election all about abortion because the media does their heavy work here. And so they are now trotting out the person who would be the likely presumed nominee were Joe Biden to stumble and fall or continue to, uh, to be as vegetable-like as he has recently been. Kamala Harris, she's out there talking about abortion. She says that sometimes she meets women to speak with them. She's excellent at this. You know, in traveling around the world, I often, in fact, almost every time when I go to a new country, I'll, I'll meet with women to talk with them about how they're doing. Oh, you meet with women sometimes to talk about how they're doing. Shocking, shocking. Well, Bernie also does, apparently. Bernie Sanders, he says that um, it's beyond comprehension to restrict abortion. He says this to a news anchor, Jen Psaki. It's amazing how she shifted seamlessly from being a propagandist for the Biden administration on MSNBC, like as the press secretary, to a propagandist for the Biden administration on MSNBC as an anchor. Amazing. Boom, right on over. No problem at all. Here's Jen Psaki with Bernie Sanders. Should courts have the ability to rule to take a drug away from millions of people like this, but also others? Look, this is a continuation of a fundamental attack on women's rights. It is beyond comprehension that in the year 2023, you have people who think that it should not be women who control their own bodies, but government. And this is just another example of that. Uh, and we have got to fight as hard as we can to make sure that women are the people who determine their lives and not somebody, uh, some right-wing politician. 
Like, good news, guys. We, we, we found the thing that uh, Bernie Sanders does not want government to control. That's exciting. So he doesn't want him to save unborn. Again, this is the, the Democratic agenda 2024. It's going to be replay of 2012 Republican war on women kind of stuff. This was trotted out by Amy Klobuchar doing the same thing. The senator from Minnesota who is um, fa- fond, apparently, of throwing binders at her staff members. The second thing is realizing where the voters of this country are. The 70 to 80 percent are with us. The Republican Party, however, is not backing down. It is doubling down, putting in six week abortion bans in uh, in Florida. What you've seen with criminalizing women, trying to criminalize doctors. Criminalizing women. How is it criminalizing women to say that you can't kill an unborn baby? It's not criminalizing women. It's criminalizing killing unborn babies and not for the women, by the way, for the doctors. Uh, MSNBC's Ali Vell, she takes this to its logical conclusion, which is, of course, everyone who is a Christian is uh, engaged in Sharia law. Yes, nailed it. They pass anti-Sharia legislation in yeah. states. There's no Sharia. Law. There's no Sharia in America. And, oh. and, but they were they were always plotting this. Yeah. They're always about projection. And now they're doing it. So yeah. the fact that they yeah. cause, you know, hate directed against our community, I think I take it more personally. So it's Sharia, right? If you're a, if you believe again, that, that you don't, you don't want people to have abortion rights, but you live in America, which constitutionally says that you can't impose a state religious belief on everybody else, but you do it. That's actually Sharia. That's yeah. actually what everybody else is complaining about what Sharia is. You've taken the good book and you have made that the law book. Okay. So first of all, protecting human life, does not require you to be a Bible believer. There are many, many people who are not Bible believers who believe that you should protect unborn human lives. But again, it's like Sharia law. This is what they are running on. So how do you stop the left? The way that you stop the left is by winning. I can't put too much emphasis on this. Winning is the only solution. Not complaining, not sending out tweets, winning. That is the only way to stop all of this. And this is why, again, I urge everyone who's about to vote in a Republican primary over the course of the next year or so, why not think about who can win? Why not think about, like, shouldn't this be a consideration? The reason I bring this up is because there is new polling data out, shockingly, that shows that Ron DeSantis actually leads Joe Biden in a in states like Arizona and Pennsylvania, states that Republicans must win. They must. Donald Trump currently trails Joe Biden in both of those states. The poll was conducted by McClatchy, D.C., and Public Opinion Strategies. And what the poll shows is that in Pennsylvania, DeSantis leads Biden 45-42. Trump trails Biden. 46, 42. In Arizona, DeSantis leads by six, 48, 42. Trump trails Biden, 45 to 44. And by the way, in Arizona, 58% of voters have an unfavorable view of President, of President Trump. 56% have an unfavorable view in Pennsylvania. Okay, we should consider these factors because when it comes to winning, there is no substitute for victory. There just isn't. Which is why, of course, the media are focusing all of their fire these days on Ron DeSantis and not on Donald Trump. It's why Maggie Haberman, who, again, is Donald Trump's very favorite source in the entire universe, is now trotting out stories like, quote, top Republican donor Sowers on Florida governor's stance on social issues. You see, Governor DeSantis is too socially conservative. And he signed into law a six-week abortion ban with exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. And, uh, and that's bad, according to this top Republican donor. Who does it turn out this top Republican donor is? The next door neighbor of Donald Trump and one of his best friends who donated a lot of money to him. Slow clap on the on the reporting side right there. Just excellent, excellent job. People should consider these things as they move forward toward the election. Okay, time for a thing I like and then a couple of things that I hate. So things that, that I like today. Katie Porter has been trotted out, this congresswoman from California, as sort of the new wave of Democrats. And that's because she does hearings where she brings out a whiteboard and then she says nonsensical things, but she draws them on the whiteboard so we have to pretend that they're sensical. I mean, look, look she can use a whiteboard. Wow, to dry a race marker and everything. Woo, ah, she's got props. And then she like takes out a, a top hat. She's like, ooh, look, a rabbit. Woo. Like, oh my gosh, it's probably real. And well, Katie Porter just got absolutely pantsed on national television by Bill Maher. And it's of her own making. It's because she's absolutely insufferable, Katie Porter. So she's on a panel with Piers Morgan and Bill Maher and she starts calling them old and it goes really badly for her. You guys it's not that he wants to do it. It's kind of old. What? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> Kids are immature. That's why they're... Kids. Not, not at 21. 
Not all yes. over the world. 21 years old are mature. That's why we don't well, you're used, drink until you're, they're 21. That's why some of us don't think that 20 year olds or 19 year olds ought to be able to go get AR 15. They can go fight. I think there are they arguments. They can be in the army. They're deciding whether you should be in Congress or not. Well, I, and, I, and by the way, I win those votes. What? And I win those votes and I'm proud of it. But I, what I'm so saying is. So you just said you win the votes of the immature. Well, but the immature. First off, immaturity is not necessarily an age thing. You can be immature well. But you just played the age card. Yeah. You were like, our argument sucks because we're old. Oops. That is the easiest pantsing on national TV maybe I've ever seen. Like, you guys are really old. You guys are really old. And uh, and and 20, 21 year olds, they're they're immature. They don't know anything. You know, they're, they're stupid. But I win their votes. But they're not immature. Katie Porter, one of your leading Democratic geniuses. Probably they should put her in the Senate instead of Dianne Feinstein. By the way, they are still Democrats having a tough time actually saying that a person who legitimately has no mental function, Dianne Feinstein, should continue to be in Congress. It's amazing to watch. Democrats, I don't even know why. Like, wh what exactly is the drive here? It's kind of incredible. Like, Dianne Feinstein, according to everyone, lacks mental function. She no longer has capacity to serve in the United States Senate. But they cannot get Democrats on national TV to say she should step down. They're like, why? Gavin Newsom is the governor of the state. They got to... Like every Democrat in the country lives in California. No Republican is going to fill that seat. And they still can't say push the old lady out. It's crazy. Here's Kirsten Gillibrand and a bunch of other Democrats being like, yeah, I don't I don't know. Uh, here's Kirsten Gillibrand saying, I don't know if we should get rid of her. Maybe she's maybe she's still there. There's been a lot of talk in the last several years about her awareness, her her, her cognitive abilities. You think it's time for her to step down? Diane Feinstein is an extraordinary senator, and she's been a role model and a mentor to me my entire career. I sit with her on the Intelligence Committee. She asks some of the most searing, pointed questions of anyone on that committee. Her legacy and her depth of experience is valuable. And we've had so many senators who have had illnesses, whether it's Mitch McConnell's illnesses or senators who have had strokes. These are issues that we're human, and we believe that a senator should be able to make their own judgments about when they're retiring and when they're not. Amazing. I mean, I don't even know what the drive here is, but apparently Democrats are just going to go with it. Okay, time for a couple of things that I hate. Can we just point out that Joe Biden is awful at his job, like legitimately awful, that he's completely destroying the global order, destroying it. So remember, when we jumped into supporting Ukraine in the war against Russia, the basic idea was we were going to solidify Europe on our side. This is the easiest move in the entire world. It was super easy. On the cheap, we were basically being able to degrade the Russian military. We were able to support a democratic ally in Ukraine. We were able to unify the entirety of Europe against Russia and China by extension because Russia was cutting off its own oil to Europe as leverage, which made them more dependent on our oil and we were able to send a signal to China they shouldn't invade Taiwan. Somehow, Joe Biden has botched this to the point. He's like so completely botched this because it's dragging on in Ukraine and because there's no end in Ukraine and because Joe Biden won't even articulate an end point in Ukraine. And also because Joe Biden has not built up the United States military and because Joe Biden has decided to withdraw from the Middle East, everybody is now hedging their bets. Everyone. Everyone in the international sphere is now figuring it's a multipolar world and we are going to hedge our bets, which is presumably why the French President Emmanuel Macron went to China and started making kissy face with Winnie the Pooh, Xi Jinping. According to the UK Guardian, it is perhaps no surprise that Emmanuel Macron is now in the middle of another big international row. France's president likes to stir things up, but is his pension, his trademark foible. Reelected in 2020, despite a disappointing first term, he has four years left to make a difference. But Macron has now gained a reputation for tossing political hand grenades intentionally or by accident. In 2019, he famously declared that NATO is experiencing brain death. And the latest explosion was ignited by an interview Macron gave after a visit last week to Beijing. On China policy, European countries were too subservient to the United States, he said. Quote, being an ally does not mean being a vassal or mean we don't have the right to think for ourselves. He also implied that defending Taiwan from a Ukraine-type Chinese invasion was not Europe's business. He also lauded the idea of Europe as a separate geopolitical pull, a third superpower on footing with China and the United States. China is loving it. China's looking at this and they're like, ah, we found, the, uh, we found the breathing room between France and the United States, between Europe and the United States, which means that maybe we ought to go for it. Meanwhile, the Middle East is being completely upended as well because of the Biden administration's signal stupidity in alienating both the Saudis and the Israelis. They've gone out of their way to alienate the Israelis by basically intervening in their domestic politics over and over. And they went out of their way before Biden even took office to yell 
at Mohammed bin Salman, the dictator of Saudi Arabia, yell at him for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Because as we all know, if there's one thing that dictators in the Middle East are famous for, it is their care for human rights. And when the United States makes foreign policy in the Middle East, we all understand this, right? Dirty hands are just a part of foreign policy. It's the way that it works. Joe Biden was like, no. I'm above all that. I'm an innocent in Mishabram. And then five seconds later, he was in Saudi Arabia begging them to increase the oil production before the election. And meanwhile, he was basically attempting to undermine the sanctions regime against Iran. Well, China has now stepped in and they're making kissy faces with the Saudis and with the Iranians. And this is why presumably Saudi Arabia is now making nice with Hamas, an actual terrorist group. The Saudi Arabia is triangulating. According to the Wall Street Journal, senior Saudi officials were planning to meet with leaders of Hamas on Sunday to discuss renewing diplomatic ties, which have been cool since 2007 reestablishing ties between Hamas, which is a U.S.-designated terror group, and the Saudi kingdom would mark a setback for efforts by both the United States and Israel to establish a military alliance between Israel and the other Sunni-majority countries against Iran and its allies. They also complicate Benjamin Netanyahu's goal of normalizing relations with Riyadh, with opposition to Iran as their primary shared interest. Hamas was invited to the kingdom by the Saudi leaders. Hamas is an overt terrorist group that wishes to destroy the state of Israel and wipe every Jew off the map. They are a genocidal terrorist organization now meeting with the Saudis. This does not happen without Joe Biden pulling out of the Middle East, opening a gap for China to fill. China and Russia have absolutely filled that gap. And so the United States is in a state of retreat and it's making the world a significantly less tenable place. Because Israel was relying on the idea that they would create some sort of detente or at least a uh, mutually assured destruction with Iran, with the help of the Saudis, the UAE, and other allies in the region. China has now upended that, isolating Israel once again from possible Arab allies attempting to do that, meaning that it's more likely that Israel will have to take military action against an increasingly militant Iran. Apparently, Mahmoud Abbas, who is 88, is planning to visit Jeddah this week and will meet the crown prince on his trip, according to Saudi and Palestinian officials. Saudi Arabia was once a strong backer of the PA. The PA is the supposed moderates, but Mahmoud Abbas is going to die. He's 88 years old. And when that happens, Hamas is going to take over. So, the, uh, so it'll be fascinating to see whether, um, whether that relationship warms. And if so, the possibility of war in the Middle East is now reaching all-time highs again. It was, it was all peaceful when Trump left. Now it's way worse. The possibility of war with China over Taiwan is radically increased since Joe Biden took over. This man is a disaster area on foreign policy. I know we don't care about foreign policy until the time that the bullets start flying, but guess what? There are things we can do that make it less likely or more likely for the bullets to fly. Joe Biden makes it increasingly likely every single day for the bullets to fly and for the missiles to fly. All righty. The rest of the show is continuing right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We're going to be getting into censorship, more censorship of new novels, plus the ridiculous hit on Clarence Thomas. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.